this. You have heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, and then he would quote from the rabbinic tradition that they had been handed through the law of Moses, but I say to you. Then he would correct the values because he was speaking to people who had perfected the appearance of religion. But he understood that if the behavior is right, but the belief that is beneath the behavior is not right, if your values are shallow, your victories will be empty. And why didn't you write that down? I worked all week on that. Gaston, I know you've got your pins out. I have faith in you. If your values are shallow, your victories will be empty. So I'm winning at what? I'm winning at what? And Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down, but then he began to teach them. He's digging beneath the behaviors to identify the beliefs. Like one of them that he said, he said, You've heard it said, don't murder. But I'm telling you, if you're angry, even if you don't murder, you will suffer the consequences of that anger, and it eventually will either lead you toward taking action on it, or it will deteriorate your spiritual condition to the point that you might as well have gone ahead and done it because you're living in a prison of hatred, and whether or not you act it out doesn't matter because beneath the behavior is a belief that led to the behavior. This is what we mean when we say Jesus was the game changer. Because he didn't just play the game, that's why they killed him. He touched lepers that they wouldn't touch. He spoke with women who they devalued. He, he, he challenged their, their social values by associating with people who ethnically and religiously had nothing in common with the Jewish people. And that's what they hated about him. He didn't endorse their values to run his campaign. He challenged their values. He got beneath their actions and challenged their values. Matter of fact, he did it not only in terms of hatred and murder and adultery, but he did it in terms of other areas. Like one thing he said was, You've heard it said, love your neighbor. But that's that's easy. I say love your enemy. See, that changes the game. Grace changes the game. I said the grace of God is a game changer. When the grace of God really becomes operative in your life, what Jesus is saying when he says, love your enemy is, you can't insist on God relating to you one way, and then you turn around and relate to people another way. So if you want God to be gracious to you, that grace has to flow not only to you, but through you. And if it's not flowing through you, it didn't really flow to you. If you don't give it, you don't got it. Now, I'm sorry for my grammar, but my theology is spot on. It's a game changer. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Father, of the Father full of grace and truth. So when grace shows up, it changes the game. And the Bible actually says that when Jesus finished teaching all these things, the people were amazed at his teaching. Not because he was so funny, not because he was so succinct, not because of the human wisdom, but he taught as one who had authority and not as one of their teachers of the law. Well, what was it that his teacher, the teachers of the law were teaching that had no authority? They were teaching on the basis of appearance. And that's what he's correcting in Matthew chapter 6. It's not a giving scripture. It's a scripture about intention. So when you give, he assumes that you're going to give. Not if, when. He's making the assumption that your actions will align with your values. And I've learned that the greatest way for me to know whether I'm winning in my life is not to ask people, you know, or not to consult certain external scoreboards that can tell me how I'm doing, because my bank account is, is a bad indication of whether I'm winning. 
or the car I drive or any of that. But when my actions match my values, I'm winning. And it's cool when you can get to that place. Not that I live there all the time, but when I'm there, I know it, and I can feel it. And when I'm living from that place, I don't need others to notice, because my Father is keeping score. Maybe we need to shut down some scoreboards that are visible in our life for a little while and get in the car like Elijah got in the car for me, and he would ask me every game, did we win? And I never lied to him about it. I always told him. Sometimes I said, no, y'all played terrible today. Honestly, it was, it was painful to experience. I love you anyway, but that, that was awful. Am I, am I winning? And the game has changed now. I mean, it's… It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy because now, can somebody please explain to me what are V bucks and what do they do? <laughs> right. Well, that's what I thought at first. Like they buy stuff. Like okay, so my kids are playing Fortnite, and they ask me, "Will I, um, will I give them V bucks?" Graham asked me, "Kid, will you buy us some V bucks?" Now, my first hurdle was. That real world money is now being exchanged for, I'm telling you, man, these, these games have changed for money on a game. And so I told Graham that I would buy him some V-Bucks. And I think I bought him like, you know, five billion V-Bucks for $10 or something like that. I don't know the system, but I bought him some V-Bucks. And then I went in and I said, uh, let me see what those V-Bucks do that I just bought you. I said, what are you going to do with the V-Bucks? He said, I'm going to buy skins, because on the game, I was watching him go around with a pickaxe, killing people with a pickaxe and stuff, you know, great family values. And I said, do you get a sharper axe or something with, with the V-Bucks? He said, no, I'm buying skins. I said, well, what do the skins do? Do they protect you from other people? He said, no. The skins don't give you any in-game advantage. It's just for people to see. So now I'm angry, because I just spent my real money for you to wear something that doesn't help you at all in the reality of a game that is already virtual. Now I'm mad, because I'm spending real money. Can I have a counseling session for a moment? I'm sick of spending my money on stuff to make me look good that doesn't really make a real difference in my soul. V-Bucks. I'm a grown man, and I got to get to the point where I don't need validation from people to do what's right because it's according to my values. You don't give so people will see you. Jesus isn't saying that you have to write your checks in a closet and put it in the mail and, and no one can ever know and don't get your tax exempt status when you give. Jesus is saying, if that is your reason, then that will be your reward. Amen. Your reason determines your reward. Well, I feel like preaching that. And if the reason I'm doing it is to be seen, then that's my reward. So if they see me, and if they say that I did it good, then that's my reward. But if I have a deeper reason, then I have a greater reward. And here's a game changer for me. I have this like Sunday school way that I see the Bible sometimes that messes me up because like I imagine stuff like when it says your reward in heaven or your reward from your father. I always used to picture like a, a corner of heaven where there was like pots of gold. It was like more like uh, Lucky Charms and leprechauns than the Bible, but it was like 
It was like these big rewards in heaven, treasures in heaven. But you know, I'm probably not going to need gold in heaven because up there it's called gravel. You see what I'm saying? Like there's not a value, a monetary value. It's like V-Bucks in heaven. So it's not going to really buy anything. But now I'm realizing that this is not a passage about, hey, man, give. And then when you get to heaven, it's going to be like, you know, your Uber is going to be a Maybach. It's not like it's not about getting this reward in another place. It's about getting it from another place. Then your father, this was the key to unlocking the scripture for me. It said, He sees what is done in secret. That used to scare me. Oh, God is watching me all the time. Ah, ah. But now I see that it means He's keeping score. And that means nobody else gets to. And when I live that way, there is a certain validation that only comes from Him. And living according to the values that He's given to me, and the world can't give that. And when I'm not living in alignment with that, then I get the car, and the car is my reward. And when the, the smell of the car is gone, then so is the, the thrill of owning it. If I, if, I, if I do it for people, then I have to get it from people. One scripture I like to think about when I'm having a pity party is one time when Paul was talking about preaching the gospel. And in certain situations, Paul would say, Don't pay me. I don't want any money from you. I want something from, from God. And he, he wasn't always doing that, but when he explained it to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9, he goes, uh, Hey, I got nothing to brag about. I preach because I'm compelled. In other words, God called me to do this, so I almost have to do it. But if I do it out of obligation, then it's just a discharge. But if I, I do it like it's a privilege, then it's a reward. So the revelation for me was that my reason determines my reward. So if I'm doing this for you, then you hold my reward. But if I'm doing this for him, It applies in every area of life. It, it applies to giving. Okay, Jesus said this. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. That, that's what he means by the game changer. I didn't come to play the game a little better, keep the law a little better, like put more on top of it. I came to change the reason that you do it. So one of those things is giving. In, in the Old Testament, you would see and obligatory system of giving, where I bring the tithe because I have to or else I'm under a curse, and so I bring God the first fruits of my produce and the, and, and the first fruits of, my, of all of my increase because I have to. It is obligation-oriented. That's how most of us live, but grace changes the game. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. In other words, I came to give you a different reason. Now it's not that I'm doing it because I've got to. I, I, I'm doing it because of the grace of God. Am I saying this right, Lord? It, it's a shift in perspective. And sometimes you keep doing the same things, but you find a deeper reason to do it. And then you find meaning in your life. But if you're not careful, you run around all your life changing the things that you do, but you find no meaning in the things. Because as long as you have shallow reasons, you get empty victories. But when your reason gets deeper, when you start saying, you know what, I'm giving to God, I'm serving God, not because I have to, or not because people might notice, or not because I'm going to go to hell if I don't, but just he's been good to me, just because I know that my Redeemer lives. That's why. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Whatever is your reason controls your reward. You believe that? 
You believe that if you have a devotion just so you can post on Instagram that you had it with a picture of your coffee mug sitting next to Colossians chapter 3, verse 7? Do you believe me that if that's why you did it, that's what you get out of it? And when it only gets 12 likes, don't cry, because I preached Matthew 6, 1 through 4, and I told you that if that is your reason, then that is your reward. I, I see it like a game show in my mind. Tell them what they've won. You know? It's like, you know, absolutely nothing, because you did it for the reason. And people will go, I left that church. Why would you leave that church? Because I got burned. So, were you in the cooking ministry? Does it, <laughs> you see the scar? Is it nasty? I get it. We get hurt. But sometimes the reason that we got hurt is because in our heart, what we needed from people was too much, and we shouldn't have been doing it for people to begin with. The applause died down by 73%. It always happens when you challenge the values. And I noticed a trend in my preaching a couple years ago that bothered me, so I've been, I've been working on it, where I was, I was preaching a sort of theology that was a little perverted in this way, not on purpose, but you just shift toward it. You say, uh, if you will, God will, and um, God's gonna, and, and you fill in the blanks, you know, like if you obey God in this area of your life, it will produce a blessing. So it was a cause and effect. What I'm coming to understand is while that's true on the surface, the real blessing is built into the process. The real blessing is built in. When he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when you give. That means that it ought to be so automatic because you've operated out of your values to the point like, like these guitar players. Is there a guitar anywhere around here? When they play, there's got to be one, right, LJ? <laughs> when they play, they don't have to think about I would play y'all talk dirty to me by poison, but that's not appropriate for church. That's the first song I learned, though. That's what I think about when I see electric guitar. They do this with the right hand and this with the left hand, but they don't. See, these hands, these hands, if I've done that enough, this hand is going, and this hand is going, and the left hand, what is this, Glycerine by Bush, I think I'm playing, <laughs> of all the <those> songs, <laughs> shot of the 90s, and if you've done it enough, it's not even a thing. And Jesus, said, I would like for you to get to the point where my grace has changed you enough that you don't have to you don't have to think about it or pray about it. God, should I give to further your gospel in the earth? I just need a sign. How about your common sense? And so he challenges my values. And that's what I've always loved about this moment in our church when we are getting ready to give or when we're calling people to serve. You know, it, it changes the game. Because when your intention in coming here is in what you get, then that's your reward. When your intention in coming is to Give something that God put inside of you. You are no longer dependent on people, and that's the blessing. The blessing is built in to the process, and I think we need to take our scoreboard back. 
I think we've adopted the world's values in some ways that have caused us to win some victories that are empty. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. Not with pots of gold in heaven, not with V-bucks and cookies, <laughs> digital cookies, cookies made of pixels, compliments from people, and an empty status that can be here one day and gone the next. When you have crappy values, you will never have lasting joy. And popularity is a crappy value. That's in the Greek. Crappy values. Yes, sir. And position is a crappy value. I'm going to work my way up. Excavation before elevation. Pleasure is a crappy value. It's a great byproduct. It's not bad to feel good and enjoy stuff, but when that's the goal of the game, it's a, it's a terrible value. And when my values are shallow, my victories are empty. So I want God to run my scoreboard. How about you? I need that. Come on, I need that. It's too stressful. It's too stressful. Life is too stressful, and too many people have too many different opinions, and there's too much to keep up with, and I can't do it anymore. So I want my Father who sees what is done in secret to keep score for me. And I want, I want him to make the decision. Was that good? Am I a good dad today? Because I certainly can't ask my kids what they think about that. I can't. Because what I will need to do to be a good parent in some seasons will mean sometimes that I am not popular. But if I'm parenting according to purpose, if I'm living according to purpose, I don't have to consult all these other sources.